it from Psalm 96. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Shall we stand to sing 166, Wondrous King, All Glorious? 166. <laughs>
in the words of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, in these me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. We are even found to be 
misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus is the righteous one who has obeyed the law of God for us. He is blessed, and in him we are also blessed with new life. Our meditation this morning will be on the Belgic Confession of Faith, beginning the beginning half of the art, 22nd article on justification by faith alone. So I'll read the article and make some comments along the way. We believe that in order that we may obtain the true knowledge of this great mystery, the Holy Spirit kindles in our hearts a true faith. This faith embraces Jesus Christ with all his merits, makes him our own, and does not seek anything besides him. For it must necessarily follow either that we all need for our salvation Excuse me, either that all we need for our salvation is not in Jesus Christ, or if it is all in Him, that one who has Jesus Christ through faith has complete salvation. It is therefore a terrible blasphemy to assert that Christ is not sufficient, but that something else is needed besides Him. For the conclusion would then be that Christ is only half a Savior. This is a remarkable statement, I think, in, in many ways, and it needs to be heard today, both in our interactions with uh, those in our community that hold to Romanism, the Roman Catholic Church, or those who hold to Arminianism, uh, many of the uh, Baptist churches, non-denominational churches in the area may have a Arminian point of view, uh, which sees faith as something that we can work up within ourselves without God's grace providing that. So the confession statement here gives us some uh, helpful uh, information from God's word as to how we may relate to them and also uh, speak to our own hearts. And so the, the confession begins with the fact that in Christ we have a true knowledge or understanding of the mysteries of God. We have an understanding of God's great work of redemption and salvation, how Christ has come to deliver us from sin and to provide the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And the confession then says, okay, if we look at the scriptures and we see the work of Christ, his person and work and what he's accomplished at the cross, the atonement for sin, how do we receive the benefit of that work into our lives. And the way that we receive that benefit is through the agency or the means of faith. Faith is, if you will, the hands that receive the grace of God, that receive the, the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. And the point of our confession this morning will be first that that faith is not something that is worked up from within ourselves, but it itself is the work of God's grace. And it's only by God's producing that faith within us that we are able to see and rest in Christ for ourselves. And then we will see that the object of our faith is a complete salvation and not a partial salvation. So let's look first at the nature of faith. Within the Arminian system, the natural man is essentially morally neutral. He has a free will which he can exercise on his own and should he so please, he may choose to follow God, choose to accept the offer of the gospel and then uh, become a Christian at the same time 
the Arminian will recognize or state as well that you may lose your salvation uh, because of a change of mind or what have you. So really within the Arminian system, you can choose for Christ, lose your relationship with Christ, choose Him again, lose Him again, back and forth, and who knows where you're going to end up in terms of your, your relationship with God. And how can you ever have a sense of security, a sense of peace in your relationship with God? How could you ever sense that you really do have eternal life? If you can choose Christ for one moment, lose him the second, and maybe turn around at a later time. So the, the Arminian system provides for a very uncertain heart, a heart that is filled with anxiety and fear, a heart that is never still and confident in God's work. The Reformed faith understands what Scripture itself says, that faith is the gift of God. You can read about that in Ephesians chapter 2. Faith is God's gift. It is the work of the Spirit of God whereby He comes secretly within our hearts and produces new life. We have a new heart given to us and we are enabled by the power of God now to see the truth of the Gospel, to exercise faith, to believe the message of the Gospel and to commit ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. That very exercise of faith is the effect of God's grace. It does not rise up within us. We are sinners. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And so, however much you want to reason with the natural man, explain to him the promises of God and so forth, his will is free, but it's bound by his sinful nature. And he will always choose sin. He will never choose to submit himself to Christ. Never choose to embrace the gospel. That is contrary to his nature. His will is bound to his nature. And so he will always rebel because his nature is evil, corrupt. That is why it must be of grace that we are saved. It must be the sovereign work of God whereby his spirit comes and produces a new heart within us, gives us the gift of faith so that now we can see, now we can receive the righteousness that God has for us in Jesus Christ. So faith itself is the gift of God. We indeed respond to the work of God within us by exercising that faith and calling upon the name of the Lord. We uh, respond by following after Christ, but the initiatory work is that of God. And apart from God's work in producing faith within us, we would never have the ability to exercise faith. Our nature in Christ is changed. We are born again. We are, we are a new creation. We are raised from the dead. And so this is something of the nature of Christ, and, or excuse me, the nature of faith. It has its origins in this, the work of the Spirit within our hearts. But then the confession goes on to say that this faith embraces Jesus Christ with all his merits and makes him our own. Um, The proper object of faith will be Jesus Christ. Faith is not trust in ourselves, trust in a, a general notion that everything will go all right in the end, that God will look out for you in the very end of things if you live a good life. It's not that kind of faith. It's a faith that looks to Jesus Christ as he's presented in the gospel. Jesus Christ who's provided a full atonement for sin and his perfect righteousness that is imputed to us. That is the object of our faith. Not ourselves, not some general idea that everything will go well, that God basically loves us and will care for us and take care of us. Faith looks to Jesus Christ, fixes itself upon Him. And whenever you begin to look at yourself, whenever you begin to look at others around you or what have you, you are in a perilous position. Because you will fail, your friends will fail, only Christ is sufficient to save. We look to Christ with all his merits. His merits include the full atonement that he has offered for us at the cross, the satisfaction for our sin, the forgiveness that we receive through that, and then as well his righteousness. 
His perfect life, His obedience to the law of God, that righteousness becomes ours. This great exchange occurs whereby the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us and is now ours through faith. And at the same time, our wickedness, our sin, our corruption is imputed to Christ. And He bears the penalty for that sin. So the great exchange takes place. My sin for Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness for my sin. And He becomes my substitute, providing for everything that I need. The confession notes that we do not seek anything besides Him. So I'm not trying to add to the work of Christ either my own personal sufferings, my personal sufferings in this life do not in any way atone for any of my sins. They, Whatever you might suffer in this life, evil things or even through your good conduct, those things do not in any measure atone for your sin or bring satisfaction for those sins. And in the Roman faith, if you were to pass from this life, you go to purgatory and therefore an ex perhaps an extended period of time, millennia, you may be there to purge your soul somehow before you can be ready to enter into heaven. You will be there for an eternity because you cannot fully atone for any sin, even the slightest sin. Only Christ, the God-man, can provide a sufficient atonement for sin. And so do not look to your sufferings as some justification for your sense of being right with God. Do not look to your good works your care for family and friends, your uh, moral life, uh, your uh, good, good standing within the community, that will do you no good. Scriptures say that all our righteousness is as a filthy rag in God's sight. Even our best works, our best works, let me put it this way, the best works of Mother Teresa, the best works of Pope John Paul, filthy rags in the sight of God because they do not rise to the level of perfection that God requires. They cannot. They are corrupted by our sin. Only Jesus provides good works that are righteous and pure, thoroughly pure, and only in Him should we rest. And so true faith rests in Jesus, not in my sufferings, not in my good works, not in the good works of the saints have gone on before me. They, cannot, they can't save themselves, let alone save me from anything that I've done. The Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, herself needed a Savior. She calls upon God, her Savior. She cannot save you. Only Christ, only Christ can save you from your sin. And true faith rests only in Him and in no other. And the confession concludes with this very stern statement, which is true and needs to be heard. It is therefore a terrible blasphemy to assert that Christ is not sufficient, but that something else is needed besides Him. For the conclusion would then be that Christ is only half a Savior. Romanism offers you half a Savior. Jesus, by his death, takes care of your original sin, puts you back in a, a proper position where you can make your choice of God and then add good works and these kinds of things. And there can be forgiveness along the way as you go to the confessional booth and so forth. That is a blasphemous system because it takes away the merit of Christ's work. We need the true Christ, the Christ who alone can save and none other. Let's respond then with our next hymn, and Rick, if you will help us with that. On the red hymnal, we're singing hymn number 521, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. 521.
When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit who illumines this page to our hearts. We pray that you would be pleased to bless the opening of your word, that you would bring us light and life through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. It's interesting that John sets the scene here, as it were, right under the very nose of Jerusalem. Bethany, he says, is about two miles away from the city. The city would be overlooking the city of Bethany, where Jesus would meet. And so you recall that the, 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 the context of this is that Jesus, and particularly his disciples, Thomas, were quite concerned that if Jesus were to come down into Judea, uh, they would be at risk of Jesus getting stoned. And so they were quite concerned about this. And now, as it were, Jesus arrives in Bethany, and it's as though the, uh, the Lord set Bethany as a little stage for Jerusalem to observe. A kind of dramatic scene whereby he's going to portray in advance what he himself would go through. And so we have a little drama within the broader drama of Christ's cross and resurrection. So John sets the, the stage for us in this way. If you look at verses 17 through verse 20, uh, he gives us all the characters who are involved at this point. Uh, Jesus arrives at, at uh, Bethany, but it doesn't go into the village. It does not go to the home of Mary and Martha. He stays outside a little bit. There's a large crowd from Jerusalem that have come to Bethany uh, to mourn with uh, Mary and Martha. Evidently, this was a very loved family and had many connections within the city. And so you have this broad uh, impact of the death of Lazarus upon the broader community. Jesus stays outside the city and here word somehow gets to Martha that Jesus has arrived. And John tells us, Martha gets up and goes to Jesus while Mary stays at home. And Mary is with the, uh, the crowd there uh, weeping over Nazareth. In many ways, John uh, gives us a, a picture or a window of the, these two women. First, you have Martha, verses 21 and following, 21 through, I think, 28, is it? 27, at least. And, and then Mary picks up the, the narrative after that, when Martha goes to, to call for Mary. And you have these two women placed before you. They have the same faith, but different personalities. They respond differently to the grief. They respond a little bit differently in their relationship to the Lord Jesus each true to their own personality. You might recall in the Gospel of Luke, we have their personalities brought out a little bit more uh, fully. A story where Jesus comes to the home of 
Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This was before Lazarus was sick. And they have a feast for Jesus. And you recall that Martha is all busy getting everything ready. She's cooking the meals and getting the table straight and arranging for all the guests and that sort of thing. And Mary is just sitting there in the living room with Jesus, listening to him talk. And Mary, Martha's getting a little upset. I'm doing all this work, and here she is just sitting here. So she comes up to Jesus and says, tell my sister to help out. And uh, you recall what Jesus said to Martha. Uh, you're, you're busy about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the better part. Rather than all this fuss and all this finery getting ready for a fine feast, listen to me. Hear my word. And so Martha was more of the active personality, the outgoing, the more sociable of the two sisters. Mary, the more reserved, the quiet, introspective uh, woman. And their personalities play out in this text as well. In, in one sense, you can say that what we have here is a testimony to um, the consistency of God's Word. You don't have different personality types now coming through, as though John was making up a story, or Luke was making up a story. They were being true to the facts on the ground, if you will, true to the personalities presented to us. So we have another witness to the harmony of the Gospel message, just in the identification of the personalities that we have before us. It's like Peter all the way through. We know his personality. John all the way through. Whatever gospel you look at, we know his personality. The scriptures are harmonious and true in their testimony about all things, even an individual's personality, their quirks. And so you have Martha coming to Jesus, first of all, uh, the more active of the two. She comes immediately to Jesus and she says, now notice, Mary would come and throw herself at Jesus' feet. Martha didn't quite do that. But Martha did have something very significant to say. A couple things here. Uh, first, Martha comes up to Jesus and says, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's a very understandable feeling. It's not necessarily the case, and probably not the case, that she was upbraiding Jesus and saying, why weren't you here? You should have come. I sent word for you. Why did you delay? She wasn't upset with him like that. She was just simply expressing her remorse. She felt that if Jesus were here when Lazarus was still sick, he would have done what was necessary to raise Lazarus from his sickbed. So that was her feeling. Calvin notes, and it might be an interesting thing to think about, that whereas she expresses tremendous faith in Jesus' ability to heal the sick, she might have been a little bit presumptuous in assuming that Jesus would in fact raise Lazarus who was sick. Jesus had indeed healed many people, and so probably the expectation is that if someone is presented to Jesus who is sick, He's going to heal that person. But you should simply assume that that would be the case. Calvin knows that when we think about God and His relationship to us, we can't presume that He's going to do something above and beyond what He's told us He will do. We can trust in His Word and rest in His promises and His descriptions, but we shouldn't just simply presume that everything will go well for us. We should presume that because I come to faith in Christ, my finances will improve, my marriage will improve, my uh, kids will grow up to be uh, stellar athletes and great citizens and, and uh, heroes on the battlefield, what have you. No. You notice how I set that in? Heroes on the battlefield? Christians can be warriors. All right. But just because we come to faith in Christ doesn't mean that God is going to bless us immeasurably, and all will go well in life. God will take care of us, will provide for us spiritually, and ensure that our souls arrive in glory. 
Now fill our hearts and minds with joy and peace and love and grace as we trust in Him. But Martha should be careful about simply presuming about what Jesus would do if He were there. That being said, Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Well, that's the kind of thing that we say to each other at a time of a funeral when we wish to comfort a loved one, a friend who is mourning the loss of a husband or a wife or what have you. We assure them that this one will rise again. And certainly that is a great Christian hope and a great blessing. Our parents who have died in faith will rise again. Our loved ones, our children who have died in faith, covered by the blood of Christ, will rise again. Christianity brings a hope that nothing else offers. Eastern mysticism might give you a reincarnation as a butterfly or as a frog with no concept of who you were in a previous existence, even if you were to come back in a future life as a king, you'd have no memory of your previous existence. There's no connection between the two. Where is there any hope in that? Your personal existence ends when you die. Forget what else supposedly happens to you. You're dead. Your consciousness is finished in Eastern mysticism. There's no hope there. <clears throat> Modernism, what you have in mainline Protestant churches today, really does not offer a resurrection from the dead. Oh, you might have your spirit go into a different world and maybe have some kind of existence, but your body is done with because scientifically, the body does not rise from the grave. Once it's dead, that's it. It's done. Modernist does not recognize the power of God to raise the body, join it with the soul, and provide for a new heavens and a new earth. Where is the hope? In the mainline Protestant pulpit. Where is the comfort at a grave site? That body you will see no more. It will decay and turn to dust. And that's that. Jesus says, your brother will rise again. Tremendous hope. And Mary responds, it's interesting, she has two responses here coming up, and each of them begins with the words, I know. I know. I know my brother will rise again on the last day. And you know, th these statements about her knowing it is, are important. Sometimes they, they can be little factoids that we have, pieces of theology that we hang our, our minds on and say, yes, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, I'm, I'm taught by my rabbis that this is going to happen, and so I believe in the future resurrection, dead, righteous, wicked, and so forth. That's going to happen. I know. Do you go beyond knowledge to belief? Now, her knowledge was rooted in faith, and we'll, we'll see that in a moment. But I encourage you to think, make sure, your knowledge of theology, the dead will rise again, um, all these kinds of things, is rooted in faith. I believe, I know for sure, the dead will rise. And so she responds to him. And Jesus then turns to her and says, I and the resurrection and the life. Whoever dies will live again, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now that's quite a remarkable statement to make. Jesus is the resurrection. He is the life. It's not merely the fact that, you know, God has told us in his word that at the end of history, the dead will rise from the dead. Um, there's more to it than that. If we are to understand the resurrection at the end of history, we must see it in Jesus Christ. 
It's only in Jesus that we can understand a future resurrection. Only in Jesus can we have any hope of our personal resurrection from the dead. Jesus is the resurrection, and he will show that and prove that in just a short period of time when he rises himself from the dead. I am the resurrection. I am the source of life. I am the one that produces raised bodies and living souls. I am the resurrection. The, the, the phrases that occur after this are explicatory of what he means when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. There are two broader, two different concepts. The one, the resurrection says that the dead will rise. Well, the righteous will rise, the wicked will rise, but not all enjoy life. The wicked rise to judgment, to, the, to eternal death. The righteous rise to life. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I'm the one that brings everyone up from the grave, righteous and wicked. They will all appear before me. I will judge all mankind. I am the resurrection. At the same time, I am the source of life. At the end of history, I bring life to the dead and give them an eternal existence, eternal joy, love, peace, all good things and glory. And so he's the resurrection and the life. And this resurrection is in two stages. It's at the end of history, but it also is now in this world. It's ongoing. He who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying that we may be dead spiritually, but if we hear his word by the power of the Spirit, as we saw earlier this morning, if we hear his word, if he produces life within us, we will never die. We will live forever. Our souls have eternal life. Scriptures provide eternal security for God's people. They will never perish. Peter says that we are born of an incorruptible seed. We receive everlasting life, eternal life. It's not ours to lose. It's eternal. And so he who lives and believes in me will never die. Yes, our physical bodies will die, but our souls go immediately into the presence of the Lord and we will indeed rise again at the end of history and time. Jesus is the resurrection and the life and we should look to him if we wish to receive these things. And so Jesus asks a question which, to my mind, as I look at the Gospel of John, is at the very center of the Gospel. Do you believe this? Everything revolves around this. Do you believe I am the resurrection and the life? You can vector the beginning and the end of the Gospel to this point in time. In the beginning, we see that um, to those who believe, he gave, the, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. New birth. At the end of the Gospel, chapter 20, verse 31, John says that these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. The introduction, the conclusion, they come together right here to this question at the very center of the book. Do you believe this? And it's a question addressed to Martha, but it's addressed really to all who read the Gospel of John. It's addressed to each of us today. And it's a question that we need to think and respond to. Do I not just know about, but do I believe these things? Do I embrace them as my own? Do I rest on them? That my hope is rooted in Jesus Christ and what he claims to be the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Everything revolves around this question. And what you have in Martha's response is, I think, the high water mark in the Gospel of John in terms of a confession of faith. 
You may recall in the Gospel of Matthew, in some respects, the high water mark is when Peter uh, is asked, but who do you believe I am? You know, what do other people say? Who do you believe I am? And Jesus says, or Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And here is this marvelous confession of the church. And Jesus says, on this rock, your confession, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not withstand it or, or, or be able to overcome it. Here, you have not Peter the apostle, but Martha. Woman responding in a marvelous way. Not just simply, if you will, the intellectual statement, which was a statement of faith on Peter's part, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, but Martha says, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of, of God, the one which was to come. I believe. She put her person into this. She embraced it. She owned it. I believe. And note, she goes, if you will, above and beyond what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. She says, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. You see the relationship between these two. Jesus talks about what he will do, his work. I am the resurrection and the life. But Martha says, the root of this is in your person, your office. You are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who was to come. And so she gives the foundation for Christ's work. The person and work of Christ always go together. And if we wish to understand his work, resurrection and new life, we must understand it in view of his person, the Christ, the Son of God. If we minimize the person of Christ, as modern mainline partisans do, and say that Christ was not the Son of God in any unique, special sense, and he was not some anointed Christ, but he was an ordinary rabbi, a man like that, then if you uh, take away the glory of his person, you also destroy the glory of his work. Resurrection is no longer from the grave for your body. Life is merely an improvement on your personal existence now, and that's about it. It's humanizing, it's destructive. Martha understood that the work of Christ is understood by his person, the Christ, the Son of God. They go hand in hand. And so Martha gives this wonderful confession of faith the high point in the Gospel of John. From this, everything else follows. And if, if you follow some of what I've been trying to talk about in terms of the covenant arrangement, following here, this is kind of like the, the point in the, the arrangement, the, the stipulation, do you believe? The implied statement is, you must believe this. And Martha swears, and in fact takes an oath, I believe that you are the Christ. And then from this point on, all the benefits of that confession of faith follow after. Lazarus will be raised. Christ will meet with his disciples and say, I am the branch, I am the vine, you are the branches. You will do good works in me. Uh, he, he goes to serve his disciples and, and wait on them. He gives the Holy Spirit to his church. All these blessings unfold to those who believe. And we'll see that happen as we go along. A high water mark. Wonderful state. So now we turn very briefly to Mary, who Martha comes back to Mary and then privately speaks to her. And Mary did go out to see Jesus at, at the beginning. I think Mary might have been more emotionally caught in the death of Lazarus, uh, overwhelmed by it to a certain extent. And she's there with the, the, the consolers who are around her, and she's weeping over this. She, she is a little bit reserved, does not run, but when Jesus calls her, she comes. It's almost as though John is setting this up as an anticipation of what Jesus will do for Lazarus. He does for Mary. Mary, paralyzed by grief. Mary, Mary consumed by her, her emotional response. And what does Jesus do 
But He calls for her. His word goes out. Like He said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Mary, come. Sometimes God needs to speak powerfully to us in those moments of grief when we are paralyzed by whatever it is that has troubled us. And God has to say, get up. Come. Move. Come to me. Don't stay at home wallowing in your grief, consumed by everything that's all around you. Get up. Move out. Those of us who are of a more sensitive spirit, who are more introspective, who feel things very deeply and have a difficult time perhaps communicating that, sometimes we need somebody to come along and say, get up. Come with me. Get out of your grief. Look, there's a new world. There's a master who loves you and cares for you. The master, is called, the teacher, is calling for you. What a wonderful thing to say. And so Mary responds immediately by uh, the power of God's grace. She gets up and the crowds, thinking she's going to the tomb, follow. She runs to Jesus, falls at his feet, and she says the same thing that Martha said a moment ago. And you're going to notice three times this statement occurs. Martha, Mary, and then the crowds. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. If he had been here, the one who had healed the blind man could not have kept this friend from dying. Verses 21, 32, 37. Mary comes, falls on at his feet, and says, you were here. And you have an interesting development here as Jesus sees Mary consumed by her grief, the crowds around her weeping as well. Jesus is troubled in spirit. And there are two possible ways in which this could be understood. And one way which I think none of our translations follow, whether NIV, ESV, King James, or whatever, none of them follow this, but it's suggested that the word here for being greatly troubled here in the spirit, the first phrase there, really means that he was upset and angry. And it, 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 perhaps you could say he, he was angry at the effects of sin, angry at the work of Satan and the way that he brings such grief to the hearts of men, um, perhaps angry at the way the, the, the folks were grieving, as though there was no hope again. There might be some of that. But as I read the text, it seems to me that our, our translations are correct in, in looking at this as saying that Jesus was greatly troubled in his spirit. He was very upset by the grief displayed before him. After all, Jesus himself will weep. And I have to think it's in sympathy for those who are in grief. Maybe I'm wrong here, but it seems that Jesus himself was greatly moved by the tears of his people. Um, I think that we need to hear that. That when we have pain and, and, and sorrows and troubles, we have a sympathetic high priest who knows what you're going through can understand it in ways which you do not perceive and can experience that grief as well. And John just quickly says, as proverbially as the shortest verse in the Bible, John very, in a very dignified way just says, Jesus wept. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to mourn the loss of a loved one, to feel the sense of emptiness and uh, aloneness and that one that you loved has gone from your presence. It's okay to grieve. There's something worth grieving over there. Now Paul reminds us that we don't grieve as the rest of the world with no hope. We do have the hope of the resurrection. And that should take the sting out of death for us, take the, the depths of grief away from us. But still, we mourn and grieve for those who have passed on. 
the text concludes after Jesus is joining these folks in weeping, when the crowds say, again, couldn't he have raised Lazarus from his sickbed? Could he not have saved him? And so John has, if you will, artistically worked within the narrative here three times, at least, and all the way along the way, Jesus wasn't there when his friend was sick. Jesus wasn't there to help when his best friend needed it. And there's a sense of confusion, at least, as to why there was this distance, why there was this delay, why he didn't help. And some would take that, at, in the crowds here, no doubt, would take that as a mark against Jesus. Why did you come? The troubles that we experience in life always put before us a question with regard to our relationship to Christ. Will we believe him when life gets hard, rough, and uncertain? Will we believe him when we don't have what we were hoping for, when we wanted it? Will we trust him for our future? And trust him for those things which we cannot explain or understand. Why does a child die in the midst of its years? Why does an elderly parent die a very painful, long drawn out death through cancer or something like this? Why does God allow these things? We don't know the answer at times to these things. There are certain things that can be said about it. But God knows. And the believer looks to Jesus and says, he is worthy of my trust. I will rest in him. He is the Christ, the Son of God, the one who was to come. He is the resurrection and the life. And so despite illness, death, tragedy, whatever, Jesus remains these things. These things are true of him. And I have to put my questions and doubts on the shelf, as it were. Put them aside and wait for him to explain these things. And they, he will explain. When we come into glory, there'll be knowledge and truth that you cannot understand. You'll see what God is doing in all these different things. And you'll be amazed. The folks in Bethany will see what Jesus was doing, and they will be amazed when we come back to this text we're going in a few weeks. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the encouragement that it brings to us to trust in Jesus, to believe in him. And we pray that each of us would uh, commit ourselves to the Lord Jesus and follow after him. And may we who know the Lord, who rest in him like Martha and Mary, trust him in the difficult times of life. And may we as well point others to Jesus who alone can bring them life. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
them to your glory and praise. Bless us as we give ourselves to you as well. May we be a glory to your name and a blessing to each other. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. As the service is running late, we're going to amend the service a little bit. And uh, we'll uh, go to our congregational prayer at this point. And then the Lord's Prayer and conclude the service. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the way in which you watch over us and the way that you provide for all of our earthly needs. We pray that as we uh, worship you together, that your spirit would bless your word to our hearts and that we would be encouraged to uh, share the gospel of Christ to others. Father, we pray that you would uh, minister to our earthly needs. We thank you that you love and care for us. We pray that you would forgive us for our many sins. Grant us grace and strength to walk humbly before you, daily repenting of sin and confessing our sins to you that we might be forgiven and walk in fellowship with you. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with those of us who have been struggling with illnesses. We thank you for watching over Avis and bringing her here today. Thank you for healing her. We pray for your blessing on her. We thank you too for watching over Dale. We pray that you would provide for her. Be with uh, friends and family of hers that are suffering in different ways in the loss of a loved one. We pray, Lord, that you would bring uh, comfort and healing uh, to the family, and we pray that your blessing will be on each one. Father, we thank you for um, your provision for uh, our children and grandchildren. We thank you today for the visit of the Baldwin grandchildren. We pray for your blessing on them. We thank you for them. And thank you for John and Esther and their hospitality pray to provide for them. Be with Heidi and her work at uh, Plumstead Christian School. We thank you for her uh, ministry there, for uh, teaching uh, young people to sing and play their instruments and all to your glory and praise and pray, Lord, for your blessing on these efforts. May she uh, be a witness to them as well, to your grace and, and love in Christ. Father, we thank you for those of us who are retired and thank you for provision for our earthly needs. We pray that you watch over us and provide for our homes and families, and we pray for your blessing and our health. Uh, we pray for those who are yet working. We pray that you would strengthen them, protect them from all harm, be with them as they travel, and we pray, Lord, that you would prosper us and our families as well. Father, we pray for our church, that it would flourish with your blessing. We pray for our country, that it would preserve it from harm. Uh, bless our leaders who trust in you. We pray that they would be effective in advancing your kingdom in this world. We pray for those who serve in mission efforts, both home and overseas, and pray that you would uh, apply uh, the benefits of Christ's death to their ministries, that many would receive Christ and rest in him. We thank you for your mercies to us and ask that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you.